Esther grew up in southeastern England, Cambridge to be exact, and as a child uh, had experiences with some extreme weather events, and that's what piqued her interest in meteorology. Uh, after earning her PhD, she uh, taught at OH, at Oklahoma, uh, Oklahoma University, and continues to work with colleagues there. Her PhD focused on extreme precipitation and flooding events in equatorial areas, particularly Central Africa. These occurrences now occur on the US Pacific coast and last summer flooded Northern mainland Europe. Meteorologists descriptively call them atmospheric records, uh, excuse me, atmospheric rivers and atmospheric lakes. Dr. Mullen's other research interests are climate dynamics and climate change adaptation. At UF, she teaches an introductory course on weather and climate, as well as two other courses, managing for a changing clim climate and weather forecasting methodology. She is also very much involved in undergraduate research support and supporting stakeholder science through assisting with climate data interpretation. So Dr. Mullins will talk to us about what scientists know about climate change and how they know it. All right, thank you everybody um, for coming. And I, I am sad that we cannot see each other in person. Probably a good thing though, at least on my part, I um, was unwell over the previous weekend and now have a bit of a chest infection. So I'm sorry if I end up having to catch my breath at times. Um, so yes, <clears throat> um, a little bit more about me. Obviously it was a lovely introduction. Thank you so much. Um, I am trained as a meteorologist, so that's somebody who studies the weather or, you know, more, no, more perhaps obviously somebody who perhaps you would see on TV talking about the weather. Um, I, there, these two pictures either side of my face in the middle um, are sort of my active moments um, in coming to decide upon meteorology as a um, career. Uh, on the left side is my school playground. So yes, I grew up in Southeast England. Um, this was my primary school, which is an equivalent of an elementary school. I spent a lot of summers here waiting for my dad to pick me up after school. And um, when summer thunderstorms would come along, I would pride myself on being able to tell people that if you counted the number of seconds between the lightning flash and the thunderclap, um, then you could tell how far the storm was away approximately. Um, and that was really when my interest in weather was born. And then a little bit later on, I saw the movie Twister, which was it, for my particular a movie that got a lot of um, people interested in um, because the idea, it, it sort of made weather so exciting, that sort of thing. Um, so in part, I ended up at the University of Oklahoma wanted to be like those people on Twister and go after tornadoes. <laughs> I did, um, but that was not what I ended up studying. So I ended up becoming very fascinated by climate science during my undergraduate in the UK. And so I'm going to talk to you today um, about um, climate change from this perspective, which uh, focuses primarily on physical climate and climate futures through modeling and through using meteorological observations um, over long time scales to see how our planet is changing. So there's four components to this talk. The first is firstly, how we know that our climate is changing, um, what we are seeing currently and what we may see tomorrow. Uh, and finally, um, what we can do about it. But I, I kind of largely leave that to other um, scholars who will likely be a part of this program in the upcoming weeks um, to talk more about that part, since that is not my specific expertise. Sadly, I just get to deliver a lot of the bad news. But I will start by just giving a sense of scale. Um, this is a, a, just a view of our planet from space. And um, I've enjoyed living in Florida um, for one, one special reason, and that is that from my house here in Gainesville, you can actually sometimes see rockets going to space. And that for me was amazing. Um, and when you, when you do that, you, you see them on the TV, they're launching, you walk outside about 30 seconds later, you might see 
that rocket come into view. And within 10 minutes, that rocket is in space. Now, admittedly, they go exceedingly fast, uh, but the, the vertical depth of our atmosphere, particularly the breathable part, is actually very thin when you compare it to the horizontal scale of our planet. Um, so our atmosphere is critical for life, but it's also quite fragile. It's not very, uh, you can traverse it quite quickly, as it turns out, if you've got a big rocket. So that leads me to part one. Why is our climate changing? Um, Eagle-eyed um, folks among you might see this map uh, and the zoom in there on the Pacific Northwest. And this was actually a heat wave that occurred last summer where temperatures in that part of the world exceeded anything that they had ever seen in, in, in their records. Um, so their meteorological instrumentational records, topping out at almost degrees Celsius, around 120 Fahrenheit. So to start with um, figuring out why or how does Earth's climate change, um, we can start with um, the, the aspects that are not connected uh, really to people. Um, so Earth's climate has been in continual change. Um, it's, it just naturally does this for various reasons. Um, there are two main um, factors, external meaning outside of the planet itself and internal meaning inside of the planet. External uh, factors in the solar radiation that comes to Earth. So the, the, the brightness of the sun, the energy that it releases, that does change on long time scales and on short time scales. So every 11 years, we go through a solar cycle that changes that luminosity very slightly. Earth's orbital mechanics, so Earth rotates um, around the sun, sometimes a little bit more like a circle and sometimes a bit more like an oval. And so that changes the amount of radiation we get. And then finally, anything that might come into our planet's atmosphere and cause trouble. Internal factors, plate tectonics, so over many, many, many eons of time, uh, the arrangement of our continents has changed and with it um, changes in the patterns of weather, ocean circulations, um, because the oceans themselves have changed where heat is um, collected at the planet's surface and where it is not uh, changed as the continents move. Um, and then atmospheric composition gone from periods where we have had more carbon dioxide and other types of gases in the atmosphere, other times when we have had less. And then, of course, the internal factor that we're almost about now is the uh, role of humans. So this requires our understanding the greenhouse effect, which is a natural part of our um, planet, a brilliant part in terms of the, our survival um, about the greenhouse effect as a negative thing because we equate it with the enhanced greenhouse effect. We have this idea of the sweating planet, it's getting too hot, that sort of thing. Um, but I like to tell my students at least that you know the greenhouse effect is a really wonderful thing. Um, without it, we would not have a habitable world. Um, we have a unique and brilliant planet um, and the greenhouse effect is part of how it regulates its temperature and keeps itself sustainable for life. So the science aspect of that is that most of our atmosphere is composed of things we can breathe, oxygen, nitrogen, that sort of thing. Um, about less than 1% of gases in the atmosphere by concentration um, are where our greenhouse gases lie. Um, of those, carbon dioxide is the most abundant other than water vapor, which um, is, an, is a natural one as well as can be modified by human activity. But we tend to focus on carbon dioxide um, because it has a larger concentration. And then below that, methane, nitrous oxides, ozone in the troposphere, meaning the lower part of our atmosphere, um, chlorofluorocarbons even, sulfur dioxide. There's all kinds of gases that uh, take up minuscule amounts of our atmospheric composition but are extremely um, effective at influencing the radiation that comes in and comes out. Um, and so those less than 1% um, can really uh, modify um, <clears throat> how warm it is on our planet. So in this diagram, you see these sort of these lines, these are the solar radiation. And this is very high energy radiation. It comes in and it heats the earth. 
And all of these gases are pretty much transparent to that. Like all of this energy will come and it will get to the surface without interference by these gases. However, once the earth absorbs that heat and changes the radiation to a, a longer wave radiation, less energetic, different wavelength, it sends some of that back to space to sort of balance things out. And these gases, some of them uh, say, hey, no, you can't go there and send it back to earth. And that uh, actually warms our planet in the natural without human activity by around 60 degrees Fahrenheit, which is stunning. <laughs> Uh, and so the origins and sinks of these um, sources and, and that of carbon dioxide or carbon um, in general, again, when I talk about carbon dioxide, I am sort of trying to umbrella the other greenhouse gases, but, we, but the focus will be on CO2. Um, we have sources of CO2 naturally from things like fires, volcanoes, um, that sort of stuff. Um, and sinks in the, in the oceans, forests, lakes and streams, the ocean is actually a major sink of these um, carbon dioxide gases. Over many, many, many eons of time, um, these two things balance out. However, enter people, and um, <clears throat> obviously in the mid part of the, of the 19th century, um, the Industrial Revolution was in full swing. And at the time, there were some scientists that um, were beginning to speculate upon um, whether or extra um, carbon going into the atmosphere would have some. Effect. And so John Tyndall in 1859 suggested that the atmosphere obviously emits the entrance of solar heat. This is the greenhouse effect, but checks its exit. result is a tendency to accumulate heat at the surface of the planet. Many decades later, Svante Arrhenius actually did a back of the envelope calculation, suggesting that doubling carbon dioxide would raise surface temperatures by up to Celsius or 9 to 11 degrees Fahrenheit above pre industrial. So he calculated this without you know, any sort of modern supercomputer and came up with these. Um, and so this was sort of the beginning of the fact that people began to realize that our changing of the composition of those gases. However, means relative to the total amount of gases could have a notable effect. Um, then as we move forward in time, we're getting to um, the present day and our use of fossil fuel increased dramatically. Um, some parts of the world have managed to stabilize their emissions, others have not. Um, and so this is this graph tries to break it up by region and parts of um, the United States and Europe have actually sort of leveled out um, or even decreased their annual emissions slightly, but other places are ramping up and overall um, emissions keep increasing. And so this is about 30 gig, 35 gigatons um, per year. And that is very well aligned to our changes in atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations. Um, so but, but prior to about sort of 1750, these records here are based on proxies. And so I believe you might have a geologist speak to you in, in the coming weeks who might sort of talk a little bit more about how we get ancient records um, of these types of things, of temperature, carbon dioxide and that. I, it's outside of the scope of me, you know, but I'm happy to address that if you have a question about it. But you can really see that rapid rise post um, industrial um, revolution. So the two are extricably, you know, basically linked there. Um, there are other evidences that we can talk about later on um, to show that these two um, follow concentration. Now, one question that is often um, asked is, well, could this not be a natural thing? Is it really true that we can influence uh, carbon dioxide concentration so drastically? I mean, after all, historically in the ancient past, these things have gone up and down on their own. Um, so one such example back here is we look at 400,000 years to present, we went cyclical period of ice ages, warmer periods, ice ages to do with changes in Earth's orbit. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to demonstrate a change in carbon dioxide that occurred in the natural system 
versus one that is occurring in the last 100 years or so. And so that's point A. This is a rise following the end of the glaciation there. And B, rise here, which you can already tell is quite excessive on this particular chart. Um, so let's put it in some numbers, some social math, as it were. Let's pretend that 100 parts per million um, change in 10,000 years, which is the scope of that, um, that period of rise there, is equivalent to a car driving at 35 miles an hour. Now let's take that 100 parts per million change in 120 years and scale that, and the scale gives us 4,200 miles per hour, equivalent to the fastest supersonic jet that we have ever made. Um, and that in itself indicates there's not really a natural phenomenon that is occurring here. The rate of change is so, so unprecedented. So we now have this radiative imbalance due to the increase of greenhouse gas emissions. The earth is able to um, retain more heat. Um, and as a result, it must raise its temperature to increase the amount of radiation it can send back to space to balance the amount that's coming in. So a lot of natural systems require balance, and that's true of our Earth. And so it, it elevates its temperature to match what is um, coming in. So <clears throat> we understand then the physical basis for climate change. Now, you know, what is actually happening on the Earth as a result of this greenhouse, um, these greenhouse gas emissions and changes to the greenhouse gas, uh, greenhouse effect, sorry. And I will just say that it's just, there's an incredible volume of data and information available. And it is hard to unpack all of it. So I'm just gonna do a very sort of surface level thing here. Um, let's just make sure we understand weather and climate first. Um, weather is what's out there today. <laughs> Climate is what we would expect today over, let's say, 30 years. Um, and so weather is the sort of the variability that's going on. Climate is the longer term um, average of what's happening. So these wiggles of weather and that dashed line is climate. And so we're concerned with climate. In order to get measurements of climate, we need, um, we need data, we need stations that are recording weather over long periods of time. This is an example of that. Um, this is a global historical climatology network. And the data available from that uh, goes back, um, in some cases, 200 plus years, but for the most part, those 200 plus years are, are relegated to um, Europe and North America. Other areas have more sparse data available. So, you know, our data is, is not complete everywhere in the world, but yet we do have in some places very long records um, available in which to look at climate. Another way that we can look at climate um, and a more recent technological advancement is to um, look at um, meteorological data from space. Um, so this is an example of a satellite measurement of precipitable water, which basically means the depth of water in the atmosphere in a vapor form that could rain out. So the higher values suggest that there's more available water than the lower values. You see the tropics have very high values. These global perspectives have really helped advance our understanding of weather and climate systems over the last few decades. And then World Meteorological Organization, so as a sort of set of standards, standard meteorological and other types of variables um, that they um, measure um, and, and that you know, nations are encouraged to measure as they can. Um, and so these are regularly monitored and all of this gives us a window into um, how our atmosphere works, how our planet's surface works and everything else that we need to figure out what's going on with the climate. If we simply look at temperature change, that's the sort of original <laughs> indicator of climate change, which often gets the global warming um, because the expectation is that the planet's warming. Um, this is a, quite a nice way to visualize this. It's called show your stripes, and it just um, takes annual temperature anomalies 
um, between two, certain years. So in this case, on the left side is Florida from 1895 through 2020. And where you see the reds, the reds indicate a positive anomaly, meaning warmer than an average. And the blues indicate cooler than average. And the magnitude of that color is how warm or how cool it was. And so you can really begin to see here both the variability over long periods of time and the more recent increase that is a product of climate change. There is plenty of variability going on all the time. Um, that changes our climate on shorter time scales. But this um, very dramatic increase in the latter half of the 20th century is highly suggestive that we're in a sort of upward and consistently upward movement now. And so when scientists have looked across the world, um, they have um, identified through observations a number of changes that are occurring at the moment. And whilst it would be great to go into each one in depth, I'd use this infographic from the National Climate Assessment um, to, to some of the findings. Um, so for example, um, where you start right pointing up, that's an increase in the trend of that variable. In arrow going down, that is a decrease. And then a sort of equals or up and down simultaneously is sort of a, we're not quite sure yet. Um, there's no specific trend yet. Um, and so what we have observed over the last century or so, increase in, increase in heat waves, higher sea levels, lower arctic extent, increases in growing season length related to warmth, um, increases in wildfire activity, heavy precipitation, decreases in, and this is just for um, the United States specifically. And it's not to say, but a number of these trends are being observed elsewhere too. And drought conditions have more mixed. Um, so the next part of this is we have observations of what's going on historically. We see a trend consistent with our enhanced greenhouse effect. Well, the really big question is what's likely to happen in the coming decades um, and, and then obviously what, what can we do about that? Um, so I'm going to go into how scientists um, are able to give us such detailed information about what our future climate might be. And um, for that, we use um, what's known as climate models. Um, and so climate models are mathematical representations of our Earth system. If, if you imagine, you know, we don't, we can't test this on the real Earth. So we create an Earth in a large supercomputer um, that's capable of many calculations per second. Um, and we split our Earth into this sort of grid, this set of boxes, and, and the boxes go horizontally around the world and they go vertically up into the atmosphere. And over each one of those boxes, we solve numerous equations related to how air moves, how ocean circulation works, sea ice dynamics, land ice dynamics, the water cycle, the carbon cycle. I mean, it's incredibly complicated. Um, all of the processes that are fundamentally represented in a climate model um, are the sorts of things that will change the climate on longer time scales. They do include weather, but weather models, although they have a similar architecture to this, are designed to forecast specific sequences of events, whereas climate models are designed to project changes in the, the parameters that most influence the climate. And so another sort of um, thing that you'll often hear is, is how come we can forecast 100 years and we can't get it right for next week? Well, the two things address different problems. Um, the climate models have become very sophisticated. Um, they started um, basically with these enormous blocks <laughs> that would represent, um, for example, in 1990, uh, the first IPCC report, the FAR, as it's said there, you just see this is Europe represented in a law, um, and you, you wouldn't even be able to tell that was Europe. And as we go into towards the present day, um, the grids on these models are smaller, which allows us to better represent what's going on in our world um, and you actually begin to also see that we can um, our planet surface much better as well which is critical we also have 
been able to incorporate all kinds of things into our models that we didn't have in the very earlier versions. Now our models include all kinds of atmosphere, atmosphere processes, chemistry, um, vegetation, uh, various aerosols, particulates in the atmosphere, biochemical, carbon cycles, ice sheets, marine. I mean, it, it, I don't understand half of this, honestly, <laughs> but the fact is that we can integrate all of this um, to create a true earth system model. So how do we represent future climate in these models? Um, we have to come up with some sort of assumption about how um, our greenhouse gas emissions are likely to change. And again, we don't know what that's going to look like yet. Um, so we, we have created over time uh, a number of different types of scenarios that um, are estimates of future changes in greenhouse gases. In the earliest days, this was um, certain storylines. So this is an example of an earlier version from the year 2000, the models back then. They use these different storylines, these A storylines, these B storylines. And so the A storyline suggested that we continue to emit greenhouse gases at quite a, a, a high rate. But in some cases, we might modify a little bit. Um, so the A1 is like if we don't do anything, the A1B is if we begin to do some. Um, and the B storylines suggest that we become local in the way that we move um, and that we um, induce our emissions. Um, and so that was an attempt to come up with different ways that our climate could change. More recently, um, we went more technical with this uh, and came up with the representative concentration pathways, which are simply just based on the amount of change in that radiation coming in versus going out at the top of our atmosphere. And the higher the difference, the the more greenhouse gases um, were suggested to be at play. So these RCP 8.5 um, suggests we have an enormous um, change in radiation at the top of the atmosphere, and therefore that's our sort of fossil fuel intensive future. 2.6 is our mitigation future where we have largely eliminated uh, that increase by the mid 21st century and we're on a downward, pretty radical downward shift after that. And the other two are sort of in between. Clearly, there's a difference here in the impacts, depending on whether we go with the high or the low emissions in terms of temperature and other things, which I'll show you shortly. And then the late, the very latest stuff, which is only just making its way into data repositories right now, um, is what's called um, socioeconomic pathways. So now we're really trying to weave in what we did initially with this more technical approach and coming up back to this scenario um, approach, which is, um, for example, uh, uh, let's take a look here. Uh, so if we have SSP1, sustainability, the planet shifts its energy development and technology very rapidly. Um, and so that would represent uh, the, um, the, the most mitigation. SSP5, we take the highway, we continue to do what we do. And the others are sort of trying to get at what the middle ground between those two might be. I would just come back to say that climate models are very, are, are quite impressively reliable when it comes to simulating Earth. Um, this is a, a visual, and I don't know how well you see this, but it, this is an actual satellite um, times of um, weather systems moving around the planet. So keep an eye on the way those weather systems move. Okay, so if I then pause that one and I go to this bottom one, this is just, this is a climate model that's simulating just any old year. And you can see that the, that the way it depicts the weather is fundamentally similar. It's creating the right kinds of weather systems. The next thing is that we can use these models to um, basically put a fingerprint on the causes of climate change. Um, and so these models have been run um, with greenhouse gases observed from the past and without greenhouse gases or the greenhouse gases observed from the past. And so this um, plot here shows the one that does include the forcing from the increase in greenhouse gases over the 20th century. 
Um, there are observations shown here, the um, blue line and the red line and the black line. And spread, this colored range, is just simply the range between all the different they use. There are about 30 to 40 climate models out there. So they're taking basically of all of those. And you can see that the, that the um, model average, which is the very bold orange line there, um, relates very well to these observations. Now let's take a look if we didn't in put in the greenhouse gas forcing from people. In no way does the climate model projection line up with what we have observed historically. So in other words, you cannot explain our recent temperature changes without the inclusion of greenhouse gases, uh, who did it study. Um, however, I'm not gonna say that climate models are perfect. There are many things they cannot do. For example, uh, the models really struggle to depict large scale planet variability. For example, El Nino and La Nina events. Um, they represent thunderstorms and tornadoes. Um, they have to sort of use largest things that they can represent to infer um, changes in those things. They cannot represent any really tiny phenomena. Um, so convection and turbulence in the atmosphere, they, they don't, the grids are too big. And they tend to underestimate magnitudes of extreme events. Um, and so again, here, the grid is the big player here. The course of the grid, the less you're going to be able to represent well. Now, scientists have come up with ways to overcome some of these issues by using statistical relationships with historical observations at higher resolution in, in, in space. So, um, uh, you know, just if we have data that's available over a wide area uh, without too much distance between it. Um, and using these statistical methods, they can correct biases in the original model and create data that's useful in a smaller regions. So this is an example here. We have our original IPCC climate model. This is temperature and you see these giant boxes, you know, that temperature numbers here are really not very representative of the actual topography of that part of California. But then we come into using observations to help uh, correct these biases. And we can now create um, historical and future projections that are really well tuned to specific regions. And this has been really, really great um, for looking at regional climate change. This is an example I show of work that I did where we actually just looked at Oklahoma and Texas and looked at changes in drought conditions under different types of model scenarios, whether the model was very dry or very wet in the future, whether it was somewhere in between. And so I'm not gonna level, multi-state level and, and pull out meaningful information. So the next part of this is what will our future be? So what we know and what we don't. So we, <clears throat> I'm gonna go through here, what we as a body of climate scientists um, have confidence in terms of training, those that we do not have so much confidence in. And these are based by and large on the projections of multiple climate models. Um, and so, uh, Confidence is related to the direction of change that all models suggest. It's also related to our um, theoretical and practical understanding of the meteorology or the processes that are involved in that variable. Um, and that's whether or not that process can be represented in those models. Um, and so it's based on those basically how much the models agree or disagree and what not the models can do, <laughs> can represent that system. So we'll start with um, temperature. Um, we are most confident about temperature. Um, there is likely to be um, an increased frequency of very hot days and heat waves across the world. This is an example just for the United States. Um, our global average temperatures are increasing, that's observable, um, and uh, polar regions have heated up about twice as fast as um, more equatorial regions, that's also observable. Um, so this example here is from um, the National Climate Science Special Report. 
um, and that is freely and publicly available uh, online if you wish to go uh, look at it. Um, but it shows uh, basically the model average number of days above 90 degrees Fahrenheit, the change in the number of days above 90 degrees Fahrenheit um, by about 2050 using a emission scenario. So a sort of more worst case situation. I mean, you can see here in North Florida, we're looking at perhaps uh, 40 to 50, even a bit more than that, extra days above 90 degrees Fahrenheit than um, historically. Um, the other thing we're very about is sea level rise. Um, as the oceans uh, experience warming, they expand in their volume. That's a very slow process. It follows um, the temperature warming on land by quite a quite a lag. If, and you know, when you try and go to the beach in May, and the ocean's still cool, but try again in August, and the ocean's nice and warm by now, you, we know that there's a lag because it takes so much longer for this heat input to heat that very large body of water. Um, and so we expect that sea level changes will continue well past um, any reduction in greenhouse gases, possibly for several centuries, although the amount of change is highly dependent on the amount of um, temperature rise. So the expectation right now is one to four feet by 2100. Um, in some areas that rise could be lower, in some areas it could be higher. Um, it's higher with higher emissions, as expected, because that's a warmer planet. Um, but its regional impact will depend on a lot of things to do with that coastline specifically. So, you know, whether or not um, it's a shallow bathymetry or a steep one, um, whether or not you have barrier islands that um, can protect that region and other types of uh, mitigations that you have applied um, to reduce the effect of sea level rise. We are confident. Um, that there is an increase, and in fact, we've observed an increase in extreme precipitation. And we are also confident that um, there will be an increased frequency in drought. Um, our confidence on the magnitude of those changes, and specifically where they occur, I would consider to be medium. In other words, there's a little bit more, um, there's some differences there in, in the various models and the various interpretations. In this case, this is looking at soil moisture change across the world. Um, anywhere where you see little dots, that suggests that there's high confidence in the magnitude of that change. Anywhere where you see these, these lines, that's just low confidence. So with the lowest emission scenario here on the left, it suggests that we could experience some degree of lowering, uh, so, um, decrease in soil moisture availability, but that that is very uncertain. Um, so the chain, the, the trend there is not particularly strong. However, if we go up to the 8.5, the trend is very strong across much of North America, South America, South Africa, and most of Europe, that we would experience uh, a fairly large degree of um, reduced soil moisture availability, which implies dry conditions. Uh, for more regional context, this is actually some undergraduate research that I'm doing. Um, with Surya Sakar, who um, is, gosh, <laughs> I think he's in uh, economics and statistics here at, at uh, UF. And, um, and we're looking specifically at stream flow projections from climate models um, for the Colorado River Basin at Lee's Ferry. So we're taking the, the Lee's Ferry uh, data and taking a look at how the stream flow of the Colorado River changes in that area. Um, and so here I'm showing a sort of this, one of those stripes analogies with a dr extremely dry model for the future and a model that does not predict, sorry, project as much drying as a little bit more moisture all the way out to the end of the century. Um, and this is for the summertime. Um, so if you look at the driest model with the highest, with high emissions, you will see that we go off a cliff in the mid 21st century when it comes to stream flow in the Colorado. Um, for a wetter model, we do not go off a cliff, but there's still a dramatic reduction. Um, so now compare that to a lower emissions scenario, in fact, the lowest emissions scenario. So we really quickly abate our greenhouse gas emissions. You actually see that with the driest model now, there is a slight decrease, but not excessive relative to the past. Note that these um, axes, these label, these colors change a little bit here between these two plots. 
And in the wetter model, there's not, there's variability, but there's not really a systematic decrease in the summer. So it, some of these worst can be averted um, with substantial greenhouse gas mitigation. So this is just to illustrate, um, not only we experience more drought, we experience more extreme precipitation. Uh, so again, you know, max five day precip amounts um, with high emission are a lot higher. So we're experiencing more precipitation in heavy bursts, but also longer periods without precipitation. So things increase in their variability. Something that we're really less confident about um, and this might come as a surprise because oftentimes when climate change is spoken about in the media, we talk about changes in storms and things like that. But in the scientific world, uh, we can only say with some degree of confidence that tropical cyclones, hurricanes um, have, in, have um, or are likely to increase in their intensity. So we've noticed that, that lately there's been quite a number of storms that rapidly intensify. Um, and that's become something of a, of a hot topic research wise is why are they doing that? Why are they just blowing up in, in their magnitude? Um, and so that, you know, in itself is a, is a likely in indicator of enhanced um, energy, heat energy going into those storms from a warmer uh, climate. And that's certainly true in this modeling study, where if you actually look at the highest um, uh, wind speeds out on this uh, right hand side here where the arrow is pointing, you see that in the control climate, which is historical climate, um, these winds are a little less strong than in a warmer climate. But actually at lower wind thresholds, we experience less um, events. And so uh, many models suggest that the number of cyclones will either stay the same or decrease. And so there's not really a consistent message about the impact on people at this time when it comes to hurricanes. Only that when they come and in the right environment become intense very, very quickly. Um, the thing that we know the least about, as I alluded to earlier, are some large scale um, variability, El Nino, La Nina, cold air outbreaks associated with the polar vortex breakdown. Um, that is still an area of active research. Climate models do not simulate this pretty well. Um, and so we actually, when it comes to extreme cold, um, this question mark over whether or not that will really go away in a warmer climate. And then finally, the unknowns, the, the sort of things that we can't, um, we don't represent in climate models yet. These are the tipping points, um, the things that, that will trigger a change in our Earth system that is um, kind of out of sync with the way we're modeling it. So a few of these um, include, um, and perhaps most notably, uh, because this is the one where we may be closest to, is the dieback of the Amazon rainforest. So for various reasons, the Amazon rainforest um, has, uh, um, has been deforested in many regions. Um, and because of that, it is changing the hydroclimate of that area. And because this area across the equator is associated with a very large atmospheric circulation that transports a lot of heat and moisture to the north and the south, um, what happens in the Amazon affects everybody sooner or later. Um, and so simulations have suggested if you remove the Amazon rainforest, you trigger quite a bit of um, changes across um, the world. And we are not too far away from that possibility. I think it's about 20% 20, 20 or so more of that region is deforested. We've already hit that trigger point. Um, the other things are you know, instability in ice shelves, which leads to sea level rise over centuries. But eventually, you know, there's no stopping it once. Um, so the implications of all of this, um, you know, I don't like to end anything on a you know, because I can clearly see that a lot of what this is, is negative. Um, and so whilst I'll leave it to others upon these areas, um, I think it's worth mentioning. Um, I teach people managing for a changing climate. And so in that class, I want us to see that there's a of hope and possibility. 
my students actually um, pretend that they and they go through a UN climate change international policy negotiation, which is very fascinating. Uh, it helps them understand how difficult it is to do international policy and um, and uh, at the same time, perhaps kind of um, gives some degree of hope that um, that we can get there. So the biggest agreement in the last um, decade or so has been the Paris Agreement, um, international policy um, that uh, was signed by uh, 195 countries that took effect um, a couple of years ago now. Uh, and so this, um, the, the key um, policies put forward here, in a nutshell, because it's very complicated otherwise, um, is, is the aim to keep climate change um, below two degrees Celsius uh, above uh, basically conditions in the recent past. Oh, sorry, pre-industrial conditions, sorry. So no, no more than two degrees Celsius rise from pre-industrial and ideally uh, 1.5 degrees or less. Um, there were some um, provisions for financing because obviously this costs a lot of money to make these innovations, to help other nations get on board, to be able to have technology transfer and resources. Um, you know, some degree of differentiation because not everyone has historically contributed to this issue and there are some nations that are very small and highly likely to be negatively affected without the resources to deal with it. And then of course there are the missions objectives. Each nation created its own set of um, intended uh, contributions. So the biggest downside with this entire agreement is that um, it had a lot of uptake because it allowed countries to make their own um, contributions. They didn't have somebody saying you have to do this. On the other hand, it's not really enforceable um, and countries would need to firmly commit to meeting the targets in order to um, prevent uh, what is considered to be dangerous climate change above two degrees Celsius. Um, this very last negotiation went through um, completing the Paris rule book. So basically the, the specific guidelines to enact the agreement. How is it actually practically going to work? Um, but out, out of that negotiation, I mean, some would say it, was, it, it went well, others would say it was a disaster. Um, the 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature rise um, to stop there remains within sight, but it requires immediate effort. We have about a decade left to make the turn and make a very sharp turn actually. Uh, so the Climate Action Tracker, which is a uh, kind of a non-policy group, I think, well, kind of a think tanky kind of thing. They, um, they try and estimate what the temperature rises might be um, associated with the policies that have been put in. Um, and so the best case here, they suggest that uh, we would end up with a 1.8 degree C temperature rise. That is if we meet every, if we implement everything that has been promised. Um, they then kind of scale it from like, you know, <laughs> how uh, various different levels of, you know, can we meet our pledges to, you know, maybe we um, just get 30 targets and then we struggle after that to figure out the next step, in which case temperatures are gradually going up. Uh, and these temperatures refer to the end of the century or like the peak uh, temperature rise that we could expect. <clears throat> so they are not quite as bad as RCP 8.5, which um, is 3.5 to 4 degrees Celsius temperature rise by 21. But it's also it would end up being somewhere middle of the road. So in between the scenarios that I that I demonstrated now. One of the things I do in my class is we talk a lot about like communicating about climate change, how <laughs> there's, there's this international policy aspect, but that's above everybody's head uh, in this, you know, in, for most people anyway. So how do we figure out how climate change in our own kind of local sphere? Um, and so the number of communication specialists, climate scientists have, have put forward some ideas here. And so I just give them um, the idea of talking about the issue it's difficult right now we're going through another dramatic global upheaval with the pandemic and so we drive in an extra fear for others you know we're a climate change right you know well, i've had enough of disasters um the other thing obviously is to people and and are you know have um as much as possible uh a real seeking to understand where people come from when it comes to 
difficulties with accepting climate change and or the solutions to climate change. There are ways that, um, that the right kind of communication um, can really kind of reduce those tensions. Um, and also being consistent with values, trying to reduce um, contributions to climate change and lifestyle adjustments where possible. Um, and to appreciate what we do have in terms of the natural world. And obviously, if enough people care about this issue, then eventually that seeps its way up to those that are in charge. And that is what we need, ultimately, um, in order to create and enforce what is necessary to keep us from hitting those worst, tar those worst outcomes. So I want to thank you very much for your time. Uh, I'll be happy to take questions. Okay, so I do already have one. Bob. Uh, yes, do you hear me? Yes, yes. Um, we often or usually think of climate change and an increase in air temperature, but it's my understanding that only about 3% of the extra heat from greenhouse gases actually goes to warming the atmosphere. So something on the order of 90% of this extra heat goes into the oceans. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the possible impacts and implications of those? Slowing of the Gulf Stream, the lack of sinking water in the Arctic flowing south. Or what, what's likely to happen there? Okay, so that is one example of a tipping point. Um, I'm unfamiliar with your specific 3%, 90-odd percent, but I have heard, you know, obviously I am the, the dominant intake of excess um, greenhouse gases is the ocean excess carbon. Um, and so that is certainly true that um, we, we have a big problem when it comes to the ocean, it's not only for their own ecosystems, um, but also the rise. I mean, I think the thing that got me into climate change in the first place was when one of my instructors at the University of Rome showed an image, or in fact got us to calculate using an Excel thing. Um, like this is, if you, you know, increase temperature by this amount, how long will it take for the oceans to stop rising? And it was very disturbing because they stop. I mean, they sort of leveled out eventually, but then you're looking at like 2,300, 2,400 years. I'm like, oh gosh, you know, this is not going to stop. Um, when it comes to the thermohaline circulation, um, there are some observations now that suggest uh, that that circulation has slowed by about 30%. Um, so it's become less efficient um, at doing that heat transport mechanism. Um, so, you know, for those of you that may be aware, this, this thermohaline circulation is part of the Gulf Stream circulation. It helps put um, warm water up from uh, this part of the world all the way up to my old part of the world, um, which allows Western parts of Europe to stay a lot warmer than they would otherwise, particularly in the winter months. Um, so if that circulation is shut down, then that, that heat transfer mechanism would be disrupted, which actually would create a cooler climate um, for parts of um, Europe. I'm less familiar with the impacts on the eastern US. Um, in general, yeah, it would, it would not be a great thing, but it would actually act against the climate change in parts of Europe, particularly. So you might actually experience worse winter weather. Um, for a time if it were to completely shut down. In terms of whether it will or won't, that is, I cannot truly guess on that one. Um, some speculate that it hits a threshold and it just disappears, and others suggest that it will just gradually reduce with time. Um, so I suppose the outcome depends on which of those two ends up being right. Okay, um, Izzy. Uh, you might have addressed this, but uh, how long does the gases stay in the atmosphere? Yeah, that's a great question. There? I did not specifically address that, but it is important. That's a very important point. These gases that I mentioned, other than water vapor, are what's considered well mixed. Um, so they tend to move across um, through the atmosphere and they sort of just, they become relatively equal in concentration no matter where you are. Um, and so this is like carbon dioxide, um, the, the sort of the, the most optimistic in terms of its lifetime is um, about 100. Usually though, it's far less than that. Um, 
with methane, it's about 20 years. Um, with some of these very, very um, in concentration gases. So the replacements, for example, for CFC, because of the ozone hole, they replaced CFCs with these other types of um, PF, perfluorocarbons, PFCs. They, are, they stay in the atmosphere for up to thousands of years, but there's such a minor concentration that it's unlikely that that's gonna be a big problem. But in general, you're looking at um, a couple to several decades. So what we put up today does not come out right away. It stays up there for quite some time. I'm, a, I'm aware that there are a number of very powerful, what we call positive feedback loops in the climate system. Uh, one, for example, is uh, the methane that's released when permafrost melts. And methane itself is a more powerful greenhouse gas, I understand, than than carbon dioxide. Uh, another powerful feedback loop would be uh, just as the, as the temperature, as the atmospheric and water temperatures rise, more water vapor is contained in the atmosphere. Water vapor itself is a powerful greenhouse gas. So there's this doubling up effect. Uh, there's also methane uh, that is quote, frozen or locked in undersea sediments. As the oceans warm, that methane could be released. At least that's what I've learned in reading and studying this issue. So uh, there are so many keys and clicks that can happen that exacerbate the whole issue of climate change once, uh, once we pass different stages of it. And so, um, you know, I used to say the future has to take care of itself, but now I have a granddaughter. <laughs> I have two children. One of them is just 16 yeah. months. He's the one that gives me all the germs. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, you know, the anxiety over the future, especially when you think about, you know, my son, probably about what we sold in 2100. Um, so, you know, I've, I've studied this time and only recently have I begun to become quite nervous. Um, but on the other hand, I, you know, the, the, the unknowns, the, the tipping points are the thing that right now are not represented in our climate model. We do not have a very good sense um, other than being bad uh, that, you know, when or how those would happen. I don't. Now, that's not to say that you might have a speaker coming up who might know more about it because it relates to sort of the geologic time scale upon and how much is, is in these um, places that could potentially be released. Um, so yes, there are positive feedbacks. Uh, water vapor is a very, uh, definitely a big one. And we're expecting an amplified hydrologic cycle with both in more intense precipitation and increased periods of dryness and drought. Um, uh, methane, yes, it's a, it's about, gosh, 23 times more powerful than carbon dioxide um, in terms of it to absorb um, infrared radiation. Uh, but yes, I, I, I guess we'll just, you know, it's one of those things where if we intend to not do anything significant about climate change, we do run the risk of releasing these additional tipping points. Um, and so that's the, the big issue there is facing against the clock in order to avert the worst um, parts of this. Now, on the other hand, um, planet Venus that experienced a, a, a runaway um, house effect, we are unlikely to experience something where our positive feedback just goes and goes and goes and it's never, and never, um, there's never a negative one to kind of reduce it. There always are negative feedbacks in the Earth system that will work to reduce it. Um, so we at least have that advantage. <laughs> you know, the pandemic has shown us that we are vulnerable to global global upheaval, and that is that is yes. going to be a significant issue. Well, and we'll have uh, another speaker uh, later on. Uh, the next speaker after, well. Uh, Dr. Doug Mary will be speaking next on the um, 
next week on the threat of climate change to water and food security in developing countries. Um, and then appropriately, the, the lecturer after him, uh, Dr. Rosenberg, will uh, talk about uh, the potential for conflict and mass migrations um, under, these, uh, under these projected or possible situations. Um, so it's, uh, it, yes, global upheaval is, uh, it may well be in the offing. So any other questions? I, I see one from Doug. Oh, uh -huh. Doug, Doug Mary has a question. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. I've enjoyed the talk very much. I wondered if you have a view on the various proposals and pilot efforts and so on, on geoengineering on somehow interfering with the systems, with the atmosphere and so on, in a way that would reduce the heat effects. Yes, geoengineering. So I do mention that uh, as one of the possible mitigations we could apply. Um, I am no expert on geoengineering. Um, I, as, a, as, a, as an individual, as a member of the public, I have a little bit of nerves with it because we are already um, experimenting with our Earth system and to further experiment on it in unproven ways, um, you know, could create more negative outcomes than, than we would desire. I mean, there are a number of engineering, uh, geoengineering techniques out there that have been proposed. And I think if one is to work, it needs to be proven to minimize any adverse risk. Um, you know, so, and, and I mean, even, even if we, so for one example um, that I had heard, I think this one is probably one that they're likely to chuck out is the idea that we employ giant solar mirrors to reflect, you know, some solar heat back or, or whatever. Um, but that doesn't really help us when it comes to the greenhouse gas increase for the effect on ecological systems, ocean acidity, that sort of thing. So, so temperature is one aspect, but there's also the actual chemistry changes that increase carbon dioxide create environment. And so for something to really work, it has to try and tackle both, I think. To, to, to answer that question, uh, uh, Doug, I wanted, just want to explain that I searched and searched uh, through the university faculty looking for someone who could speak to that those technological uh, the potential technological uh, solutions and uh, I do have uh, Dr. Hal Knowles coming on next to last speaker I'm not sure that he's really going to speak to what I asked him to speak to but that's that's the way it goes when you put together these programs um, uh, hopefully we will hear something about that. And it's, it is ironic to me that there's a whole college at the University of Florida that has sustainability in its, in its title. And I went, to the, I went to the director of it and he referred me to somebody who said, oh no, I, I'm not gonna talk about that. You know, that's so, <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, this this uh, gentleman, uh, Dr. Knowles is with the Florida Climate Institute. Um, we'll see what we can get from, from him. Okay, Any, anything further, anybody? Well, thank you so much, Dr. Mullins. Oh, I really appreciate the, I think, uh, your, your talk. Oh, sorry. I, I know we learned a lot from you and uh, it was really excellent. Thank, thank you. you. I think I did get one more. Is that a hand raise from John or was that a clap? Because I got... I, Okay, okay. Well, if there's any follow up questions, I am very happy to take them through email or, or anything like that. Can you hear me now? Oh, okay. oh, I can hear you now, yes. Okay. Um, it's easy for people of our age to say, well, there's very little I can do about this. That, that's up to the next generation. I'm curious to know how your students react to these kind of presentations and also how this is taught in, in, the, the, uh, in public schools these days and how much of this they get and can absorb and uh, uh, can uh, and what their reaction to it is. Do you have any ideas about that? 
Um, well, very briefly, I mean, I think that's that's worthy of a longer conversation. Um, my students, how they react uh, in general, a lot of them, you know, it's kind of a mix. I don't want them to be depressed, but some of them do feel a little bit dissatisfied or, um, you know, those that communicate with me about it anyway, I think they realize that just the, the depth and the difficulty of international policy negotiation means that the status quo tends to just stick around longer because you just people cannot agree figure out ways to really you know the, com the complexity of the challenge is enormous um in terms of public schools that is something i'm very interested in and i have actually i've taught i haven't talked about climate change directly at public schools but i'm certainly open to doing that because you know i i've i've talked with a number now um just doing some kind of weather related stuff and it's been absolutely a joy um i think it'd be great to have more interaction between pre-collegiate education and college. And I have a, a grant proposal where I have some funding um, to sort of to work at that a little bit more. So hopefully, um, you know, I know there are places where this is done very, very well, but hopefully we can begin to educate, but not scare the younger generation um, about these issues. Yeah, I think, I think uh, children need to, children and uh, uh, other, as we get older, have to get a steady dose of of this because because it's 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 terrible to to say well there's nothing we can do about this because because but the first thing we got to do is to understand that this is that this is a real phenomenon and it, and it is coming toward us and and can't be can't be ignored. Exactly, I agree. All right, thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> Appreciate you attending. Thank you. And see you next week, everybody. Thank you for coming.